Hey guys, Mr. Ridgeway here. Um, so I am recording this uh, a bit late at night because, you know, schedules and, you know, trying to get everything squeezed in right now with e-learning and virtual learning is a little bit crazy. Um, but what I thought we might do uh, is a little bit of something that's going to be a combination of stream of consciousness so you can hear um, how somebody is thinking who is encountering a difficult text for the first time. Uh, second, uh, kind of combining that with understanding this particular text, Aristotle on Master and Slaves, uh, and then last but not least, um, kind of going along with the whole stream of consciousness an idea, um, an actual a guide to annotation and things that I would recommend trying to do uh, when annotating a text. And again, we'll probably get into some other things that might extend out that we might get from this. Um, so we have here probably the most difficult text uh, that I, I have encountered, at least in part of the the whole vush 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 uh, experience. Um, so uh, what is it? It's Aristotle's on master and slaves. And so uh, I guess what we're going to kind of do then is also kind of combine this with uh, an audiobook because this will be an audiobook experience for you, uh, or audio yeah, audiobook such audio article I guess because it's not a full book. Um, experience for you if you have not read the text yourself. Now, that being said, um, I'm probably going to be pausing frequently on this, so if you expect this just to be a straight audiobook recording, um, you're probably in the wrong place, and one doesn't exist because the, um, you know Aristotle is super dead. Um, but, uh, again, I hope this is helpful for you in terms of understanding what's going on. Anyways, en enough introduction stuff, Let let's get to the good things. I'm going to be annotating on top of this article um, while I'm talking. Okay, so hopefully I can get my Microsoft thing to collaborate. Please, please let me draw. Thank you. Okay, um, and let's let's do it. Let's let's actually do some things. Okay, so again, first thing that I'm going to do, just from like a reader's standpoint, is I'm going to look at the title of the document. We got Aristotle and Master and Slaves, and then a lot of text. Okay. Now, uh, by the way, this is the first time that I have read this thing. So you are literally seeing me process Aristotle and what he's going to say um, for the first time. Just I wanted to make this as unblemished as possible. Let's see how many pages this thing is. 13, okay, 4, oh, well, well we're, still, we're still going here. Okay, so uh, it's like... Okay, it's like five pages. All right, so uh, not the thickest Aristotle thing that I've ever read before. Had to read quite quite a, you know, Nicomachean Ethics was uh, a little bit longer, but uh, okay, well, let's go on. All right, so first I'm going to read is the title. So document 1-4, Aristotle on Master and Slaves. The Greek philosopher Aristotle, 384 to 322 BP, sought to discover that, I don't know what BP, what is BP? I'm guessing that's before Common Era, but... Uh, we don't we don't know. Um, sought to discover the first principles of knowledge using observation, logic, and argument. He headed a famous school in Athens, beginning in 335 BP. And after his death, the students wrote down version of his lectures they had heard, the source from the selection from the politics. Although relatively few Europeans who encountered Native Americans had actually read Aristotle, his ideas strongly influenced medieval Christianity and were widely diffused by the church. The following excerpts on master and slaves describes ideas most Europeans in the 16th and 17th centuries considered to be common knowledge. All right. So my guess what I'm going to be encountering here is a lot of background theory slash knowledge. And I know this a little bit from my own you know, knowledge as well, is that, um, is that Aristotle, first of all, he's very, very um, logical in terms of his argumentation. He likes to like when he like when Aristotle likes to argue, he likes there to be structure um, to his argument because he thinks that the the actual structure in and of itself a like helps strengthen the argument. So I'm going to be kind of looking for that. And then also I know um, because a lot of slave owners and this again first for my own background knowledge uh, were highly highly read in terms of like ancient influential Greek philosophers and um, you know people of that nature. Right, uh, a lot of them could just you know they read Greek for fun because you know these these were fun things for you know rich people to do back then. Um, that that is also going to kind of be a, my guess is this is going to be something that like slave owners would commonly pass back and forth between each other, or at least have this kind of like common background or literature of understanding between each other. Let's go on. Okay, so. 
but they're going to be considering this common knowledge, okay, on masters and slaves. All right. First of all, there must necessarily be, okay, so this is in the politics. First of all, there must necessarily be a union or pairing of those who cannot exist without one another. Male and female must unite for the reproduction of the species, not from deliberate intention, but from the natural impulse, which exists in animals generally as it also exists in plants, to leave behind them something of the same nature as themselves. Okay, I'm going to stop right away. So, automatically, I'm going to, first of all, realize that this goes back to the title. Okay, so there was, there was this binary made right here, right, on masters and on slaves. Um, so notice Aristotle referring to nature, that's important here, um, because my guess is we're going to come back to the natural order of things, that idea, that trope. Um, my guess is we're going to probably be seeing that again. I don't know because again I haven't read this before, but we're going to we're going to see. So notice he mentions like male and female, not. <laughs> this is again weird to think about. Not from deliberate intention. They don't they we don't do the scootily poop um, because we want to. We do it because we ha uh we do it um because it's something so naturally animalistic or impulse like it kind of impulsivistic. Uh, in, in us. Okay, sure. All right, let's keep going. Next, there must necessarily be a union of the naturally ruling element within the element which is naturally ruled for the preservation of both. The element which is able, by virtue of its intelligence, to exercise forethought is naturally a ruling and master element. The element which is able, by virtue of its bodily power, to do the physical work is a ruled element which is naturally in a state of slavery, and the master and slave have accordingly a common interest. All right, there was a bunch of very important stuff there. Let's actually understand what the heck just happened. Notice I'm only like five sentences into this thing and I'm having to stop like crazy, okay? This is very typical of Aristotle because every word is important, kind of like hinges on helping you understand what's going on. So he's saying that, for example, like you can't have male without the female to which of course many modern day gender scholars would be like you can't be that black and white about things but for aristotle again it, he he doesn't like he he doesn't look at it this way he he's in he's in this binary thing right where if you want to be a ruler you must have ruled if you want to uh be ruled then you must have a ruler etc 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 okay um so a naturally ruling element. Okay, let's see how he decides, and then let's go, let's, so, I'm just gonna make a new binary here called ruling. And he, and this is my understanding of what we just read, he says, the element which is able by virtue of its intelligence to exercise forethought, okay? By the way, for Aristotle, and this just also comes from my own basic uh, basic reading of, of some of our Aristotelian philosophy is that Aristotle thinks that critical thinking is the end-all be-all. Like that is the purpose of being, essentially, uh, is the ability for you to think. So he ties in, on the one hand, we have a group of people, what he's saying here, the element which is able by virtue of its intelligence to exercise forethought is naturally a ruling and a master element. So if you want to be a ruler, a master, you have to be the thinking. You are a brain. You are a floating brain in a jar. Let's let's go with that. Um, and then if you are not ruling and you are just the physical work, the body power, You have no critical thinking as according to Aristotle, and you are just the slave. It sounds like my cat is begging at the door. One second. Let's see. <sighs> if you wanna if you wanna listen to Aristotelian philosophy, you can. Don't meow. All right. Where 
apparently my cat heard Aristotle and was like, please give me more. Okay, let's keep on going down here. The female slave, or the, uh, sorry, the female and the slave are naturally distinguished from one another. Mong barbarians, however, the female and the slave occupy the same position. The reason being that no naturally ruling element exists among them, and conjugal union thus comes to be the union of female who is slave with a male who is also a slave. This is why our poets have said, meet it that barbarians people should be governed by the Greeks. The assumption being that barbarian and slave are by nature one and the same. Okay, I'm not going to lie, I don't understand anything about that paragraph, what I just read. The female and the slave are naturally distinct. Do you understand what they're saying there? I don't understand what they're saying here. Among barbarians, however, the female and the slave occupy the same position. The reason being that no naturally ruling element exists among them. Hmm. Okay. I think we're either getting, unless I'm misinterpreting this correctly, we're just getting straight gender inferiority here. Is what I'm picking up. Female barbarian slave. Our poets have said. All right, I think that's what we're getting here. The female and the slave are naturally distinguished from one another. So saying that those two things aren't necessarily the same, but among barbaric peoples, they occupy the same position. Meet it, meet it, is that barbarous? Should be governed by the Greeks. Barbarian and slave are by nature one and the same. I think that's what we're getting here. That sounds about right. So, in conjugal union, thus comes to be a union of a female who is a slave with a male who is also a slave. I don't know. This paragraph is kind of stumping me. I'm not sure how this figures into the picture, to be honest. I'm going to kind of set this one aside and come back to it. And again, I apologize for the long pauses, guys, but like this is me trying to think about how this actually works. I'm not sure how this fits in Aristotle's argument yet. Let's let's set them aside just for a moment. The first form of association naturally instituted for the satisfaction of daily occurrent needs is thus the family. A complete household consists of slaves and freemen. But every subject of inquiry should be examined in its simplest elements. And the primary and simplest elements of a household are the connection of master and slave, that of husband and wife, and that of parents and children. Okay. All right. So this is starting to make a little bit more sense now. Okay. So notice that he is trying to set up, like, we, we've got very much a definition. We're starting with, like, the basic a a atom or unit here of a household. Right. And again, I don't, I don't, that's, that's a square, an atom. I don't know. I can't make an atom shape with my hands. Um, we, we have this divide, right? Um, so I'm going to kind of like draw a window here. So we've got like male. And again, this is a family that I'm drawing here, female and then slave male and slave female. This is like a bad Punnett square is what we're making here. And that of the wife and that of the parents of the children. Yeah. So, and then also, I guess you would add then like, you know, parents, children would be another one. So again, parents would apply to both these. Not saying children are equal to that of slaves. That doesn't seem to be his argument here. But like we have this kind of like a like tit for tat, like again, this this binary that's being set up, right? My guess right here with the, what's happening with this paragraph, the one that we skipped, is that this in this it was this sentence right here the female and the slave occupy the same position my guess as to what he is saying there the assumption being that barbarian and slave are by nature one and the same Well, barbarians, however, now again, who would Aristotle consider to be barbarians? Probably non-Greek people, 
Okay, the female and the slave occupy the same position. I think we're getting some gender inequity, but I think there's like a tinge of racism in here too, or at least otherness, xenophobia. The conjugal union thus comes to a union of female who is a slave. Who is slave with a male. Notice I'm returning to this paragraph again. Who is also a slave. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Again, I'm I'm I feel like my my knowledge is being challenged by that paragraph, but let's let's keep going. Okay. Property is part of the household and the art of acquiring property is part of household management, for it is impossible to live well or indeed at all unless the necessary conditions are met. Okay, sure. Each article of property is thus an instrument for the purpose of life, property in general, is quantity of such instruments, and the slave is an, in, an, an animate article of property. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay, all right. Oh, boy. All right, and the slave is an animate article of property. That's what, apparently, that's what they are. And subordinates, or servants in general, may be described as instruments. Okay. Well, that's... Oh boy. All slaves are property and all they all that they exist they, they you exist as a tool. You're not a human being according to Aristotle. You you're part of a you you're part of the, the the necessary conditions um in order for people to live well. That's that's what they exist as. Let's let's keep going. Yikes. The term article of property is used in the same way in which the term part is also used. What? Term article of property. A part is not only a part of something other than itself, it also belongs entirely to that other thing. It is the same with an article of property. Accordingly, while the master is merely the master of the slave and does not belong to him, the slave is not only the slave of his master, he also belongs entirely to him. Okay. Part is not only a part of something other than itself. It is also belongs entirely to that other thing. It is the same with an article of property. Accordingly, while the master is merely the master of the slave and does not belong to him, a slave is not only the slave of his master, he also belongs entirely to him. Interesting. Article of property is used in the same way. A part is not only a part of something other than itself. It also belongs entirely to that other thing. Hmm. Okay, so let, let's think about it this way. A, a tire of a car. That's my beautiful tire. You're welcome. Um, it also belongs entirely to that other thing. So, okay, so here's, here's what I think Aristotle is saying with this, is that a tire exists as a tire, right? But it, but if you're saying the tire is part of the car, the tire cannot exist separate, um, from that of, uh, like the, the tire belongs entirely to, to the, to the car that is, you know, part part of the vehicle, right? So this this thing it does it, it exists as its own all, as an entity, right? But it only exists it, it only exists because it belongs entirely to the car, right? So let's let's just go with that. From these considerations, we can see clearly what is the nature of the slave and what is his, his capacity. Anybody who by nature is not his own man but another's is by nature a slave okay and that is right there the definition of what he's going to do any by nature who is not his own man but another's is by nature a slave okay so so i need to kind of update what i just said about the the car thing basically saying that your car tires are not their own individual things they are owned by the car Okay, because they're not, it's not just like a car, it's, it's, it's like the difference between you like going out to the gym and flipping tires 
and those tires are not slaves. But as soon as you slap tires onto a car, it belongs to the car, and that and that tire is a slave. Okay, sure. Anybody who, being a man, is an article of property is another man. An article of property is an instrument intended for the purpose of action and separable from its possessor. And notice again for the purpose of action, right? So we have this. We have this refer back to like the muscle. Hmm, okay. All right. So what we've gotten so far, just to take like a, a moment back here, is we have defined what slavery is for Aristotle. Okay. So first of all, there seems to be a very much a natural order of things. I'm not going to get too lost in this like female and slave thing, because that seems to be kind of something very specific that he's referring to about people that are around the Greeks. Um, but I'm going to kind of just take like a big macro step back here. And here's what he seems to be arguing is that there is a natural order in terms of the, the world. Um, and we can see this in binaries, right? Uh, Aristotle seems to be very binarily obsessed here. Um, and then he's also defining what an article of property is. And he says, uh, anything that, uh, okay. Each article of property is thus an instrument for the purpose of life. Okay, so he's basically saying that because slaves are used to improve their slave owners' lives, they're property. Okay, so let, let's start, if you will, here um, a little, a little divide, uh, a little argument kind of thing. So number one, okay, his first claim is that um, there are natural divides. Okay, they're like natural, natural binaries exist, natural divides exist, okay, um, between, for example, male, female, um, you know, slave, okay, not, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. Um, now, then, so this is what we call a syllogism is kind of what we're making here, by the way, okay, if you want to uh, learn what this is called. Syllogism. Syllogisms are very fun. Um, you can also have um, lo lots of fun making arguments, which is a weird thing to say. You can't. I mean, it's it's nerdy, but you know, whatever. Okay, natural divides exist. So uh, then, claim number two. Okay, we got some premises, if you will, here. If we're going to use the language of a of a syllogism, um, is that it was it was with this property argument. Okay, property. This is an instrument for the purpose of life. Yeah. Okay. So property exists. Exists. To improve life. Okay. Sure. Let's go with that. Uh, and again, then he says that slaves are property. That's claim number three. Okay, slaves are property. Number four. Okay, uh, thus you could claim out of these these two things then slaves exist to improve life, right? Notice how I combine two and three together. And then he defines what a slave is. So I guess I can add a fifth one onto there. So five um, slaves are anyone. All right, guys, I am back. Okay. So, I don't remember where I was. Oh, yeah, I remember reading something about the pro-slavery argument. Okay, here we go. So, 
we may thus conclude that all men who differ from others as much as the body differs from the soul. As much as the body, okay, or an animal from a man, okay, uh, as is the case with all those who function as body service and those who produce their best when supply such service, all such are by nature slaves. In their case, as other cases just mentioned, it is better to be ruled by a master. Someone is thus a slave by nature if he is capable of becoming the property of another, or if they actually become another's property, and he participates in reason to the extent of appending it in the other, though destitute of himself. Other animals do not apprehend reason, but obey their instincts. Even so, there is little divergence in the way they are both used. Both of them, the slaves and tame animals, provide body assistance in satisfying essential needs. Okay, so really all this latest paragraph is is kind of confirming everything that we knew so far. It is nature's intention also to erect a physical difference between the bodies of free men and those of slaves, giving the latter strength for the mental duties of life, but making the former upright in carriage though useless for physical labor, useful for the various purposes of civic life, a life which tends, as it develops, to be divided into military service and the occupations of peace. Okay. And this sentence right here seems to be a really good conclusion of everything that we talked about so far. It is thus clear that just are some by nature free, so others are by nature slaves, and for these latter, the condition of slavery is both beneficial and just. Yikes. <clears throat> but it's easy to see that those who hold an opposite view are also in a way correct. Slavery and slave, an opposite view of what? Okay, our terms. Kind of slave and of slavery which owes its existence to law. The law in question is kind of understanding that those vanquished in war held to belong to the victors. That slavery can be just, justified by a convention as principle against which a number of jurists bring an indictment of illegality. They regard it as a detestable notion that someone who is subjugated by force should become the slave and subject to one who has the capacity to subjugate him and is his superior in power. Even among men of judgment, there are some who accept this view and some who do not. The cause of this divergence of view is to be found in the following consideration. So this is talking more about like military things right like so if you're captured in battle let's keep going it thus appears that power never goes without good qualities and no other argument has any other co cogency or even plausibility against the view that one who is in superior in goodness ought to rule over and be the master of his inferiors there's a sense in which good qualities when they are furnished with the right resources have the greatest power to subjugate and a victor is always preeminent in respects of some sort of good interesting okay there are some who clinging as they think to a sort of justice for law is a sort of justice assume that slavery and war is just Simultaneously, however, they contradict that assumption. Okay, not sure how they contradict it, but... For in the first place, it is possible that the original cause of the war may not be just. And in the second place, no one would ever really say that someone who does not deserve to be in a condition of slavery is really a slave. No one would ever say... This is confusing because we're going to need a lot of double negatives here. So he's saying that slavery and war is not just. How is it not just? Slavery and war is wrong. Okay, well, well let's let's understand how he's doing this. So he's saying, first of all, slavery and war is not okay because for the, the war may not have been fought for the right reasons. Okay, sure, that's true. I mean, there's going to be a lot of things that go into that. And in the second place, no one would ever really say that someone who does not deserve to be in a condition of slavery 
is really a slave. Hmm. If such a view were accepted, the result would be that men reputed to be of the highest rank would be turned into slaves, or the children of slaves, if they or their parents happen to be captured or sold into slavery. This is the reason why they do not like to call such people slaves, but continue to confine the term to barbarians. Okay, so he's basically saying, like, how does a person become a slave? Is it this artificial process? by which like you get captured in war and thus you are enslaved and now all of a sudden you've taken on these qualities of an enslaved person or then on the other hand notice he's been arguing up until this entire time that slavery is something you are naturally born with so right now aristotle's wrestling with this question of can you artificially impose slavery by losing in war and he's gonna have to disprove this right that's kind of what he's gonna have to do here They are driven, in effect, to admit that there are some who are everywhere slaves and who are everywhere free. The same line of thought is followed in regard to good birth. Okay, but I skipped one. But by this use of terms, they are in reality only seeking to express the same idea of a natural slave, which we began by mentioning. They are driven, in fact, to admit that there are some who are everywhere slaves and others who are everywhere free. The same line of thought is following in regard to good birth. Greeks regard themselves as well born not only in their own country, but absolutely in all places. They regard the barbarians as only born in their own country. Thus assuming that there is one sort of good birth and freedom which is absolute and another which is only relative. It is thus clear that, it is not true that, when men of the highest rank are enslaved as results of war, they are natural slaves. So it is thus clear that, it is not, so it is not true he argues, when men of the highest rank are enslaved as a result of war, they are natural slaves and the victors are natural freemen. It is also clear that there are cases in which such a distinction exists, and here the beneficial and that the former should actually be a kind of slave law or master. But a wrong exercise of this role by a master is a thing by which disadvantages for both master and slave. The part and the whole have an identical interest. The slave is part of the master in the sense of being a living but separate part of his body. There, there is a community of interest and a relationship of friendship between master and slave, when both of them naturally merit the position in which they stand. But the reverse is true, when matters are otherwise, and slavery rests merely on legal and superior power. The argument makes it clear that the rule of the master and that of the statesman are different from one another, and it is not the case that all kinds of rule are, as some thinkers hold, identical. One kind of rule is exercised over those who are naturally free, the other over slaves. And again, the rule exercised over a household by the head of its monarch, for all households are monarchically governed, okay, sure. while the rule of a statesman is, is rule over freemen and equals. Interesting. So he's kind of dividing there into like a separate track about like how are people ruled. But let's, let, let's take this for what we've got so far, okay? So this is kind of, at the end, he, he seems to kind of take a left turn and he's having to deal with this challenge that somebody must have brought to him. I, at least I would imagine this is what occurs where he's like, well, what if you lose in war and then you're, you were never naturally born a slave, but now you've been artificially imposed as one. And he, he's trying to do mental gymnastics to get him to the point where he's basically saying that that's not the same thing. This is an apples and oranges comparison. Um... Interesting. Okay, so let's let's take a step back and actually understand why why we're reading this for the value of what we're reading it. Okay, I would argue that ultimately, um, it, it comes back to this theme that we talked about here. I'm going to change my color because I'm going to go back and like highlight like my big important ideas. This idea of Slavery is a natural human outcome. Okay, um, like the these conclusions, I think are really really important. Okay, uh, and basically, this idea and this kind of was highlighted on the last page. that because people by their nature, okay, are capable of certain things and capacities, 
and this the, I think I think really this blue line is like the conclusion of his entire argument um because at that point then he takes the left turn down like the whole artificial slavery thing uh It is thus clear that just just or some are by nature free, so others are by nature slaves. And for these latter condition of slavery is both beneficial and just. So it's justified, but not only that, and we kind of mentioned that with the pro-slavery argument thing too, it's um it, it is beneficial to both parties. Okay? So what what are we supposed to get out of this? Like I I would argue that this right here is a really very um what's the word that I would uh, I I could understand why this would be cited by slave owners because of its logical thinking about who is should be naturally free and who should naturally be enslaved. I don't agree with it, but I can I I can understand the context of the argument that's being made here parents, children, right? We get all the binaries. So again, he was setting up this natural order, the binary thinking, right? This natural divides. Property exists to improve life. Therefore, slaves are a property. And, uh, and if, if those two things are together, then slaves exist to improve life. And therefore, how do we define who a slave is? Anyone who's not independent. And that kind of goes back to this kind of not this this natural divide between the two, right? So this argument kind of bends back upon itself. Um, that because this, because uh, there are people who are enslaved and people who are not, that therefore, um, that there must be some kind of natural divide. It's like a self, it's like a self kind of um, cyclical, uh, cyclical fulfilling argument, if you will. Interesting. And also, I think him tying it back to the brain and the body is notable. Okay, the idea that, like, again, certain capacities, like masters, have logic and reason versus slaves who operate off this, like, animalistic impulse and feeling is also very reminiscent and, ve and will get echoed down in a lot of things afterwards. So, that would be my reading of this text. Notice, I did not do a lot of annotating on, like, past this circle. And because that's kind of, he takes this really left-hand turn that I didn't think that this kind of stuff was valuable. Also, notice a couple of things that I did, like, uh, and I was thinking about this uh, as I was getting Booker back to sleep when, when he woke up. Um, is that there was a lot of this that I skipped and I didn't understand at first. And I had to go on to, like, read something and then, like, return to it and write summaries afterwards. That's also a skill that's um, really important. So, uh, again, being a good reader doesn't necessarily mean that I have to read everything in order at once and understand what it all means, right? That, that, that takes time. Um, so I hope this was helpful um, for you going through Aristotle on Master and Slaves. Um, please let me know if you would like me to um, annotate and do some other texts uh, with you. Uh, this is probably going to be one of the more complicated ones we will do just because it's hard to read Greek philosophy. Um, but other than that, I will see you guys in the next video and I hope this helped. Bye-bye.